We're going to have a, uh, quite a few verses to be following along today. Uh, you can follow along in your Bible. That'll be coming, not right away, but it'll be coming. Um, and then there'll be other verses. Actually, they'll all be up on the screen for you today. But if you have your Bibles with you and uh, you can be prepared to read there, that'll be great. We're going to be talking today again about how necessary it is for each and every one of us, for all people and for all nations. Thinking about how necessary it is for everyone to be in a right relationship with God. Which always begins with being changed. A right relationship with God is going to begin with being changed. Changed from our sinful selves into the forgiven in Jesus Christ. We could say being changed from sinners into saints. Uh, before I, well, let's put, the media, let's put the word up here for saints. You know, there's an awful lot of people that you talk to that think the word saints only has to do with people who are Christian and who have died. They're the saints. We remember the saints. We have all saints day. Uh, that's partially true, of course, because they're Christians and they're saints and they died, so they lived a, the life of a saint. The Apostle Paul talks a lot about it in numerous places in the New Testament. This is the text, um, this is the title of the message today. Remember, we're continuing a series, Restoration and Rehabilitation, Part 2. This is about the sacred call. Uh, so let's throw this up, uh, the next screen then, Scott. Saints, faithful and devout ones, if you are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're walking with Him, striving. Nobody's perfect, we all know that. You're striving to walk with Christ, um, hopefully thriving uh, as we do that. With the faithful and devout ones, those who are set apart to God. That's simply what the word saints means. Now, as we go from here, what I'd like us to be thinking about, because I'm going to be talking about people, and I'm going to be talking about nations, and much of what we're going to be reading about applies to entire nations. So throughout this whole series that I'm doing, I started last week, be continuing today, and for who knows uh, how long. I want you to be thinking about, when, when we're talking about the nation of Israel, at the same time, I'd like you to be thinking about America. So as we talk in the Bible, whatever scriptures we read that seem to be applying to the nation of Israel, and whether it's just the northern kingdom of Israel or whether it's the southern kingdom of Israel that we end up talking about. But when we talk about Israel, I'd like you to think about America at the same time. Just keep the two in your mind. Uh, that's all I want to say because I don't want to go, on, go, go too far ahead right now. We need to go from sinners to saints. At some point in time, everyone, every single person who hopes to be with God forever in eternity must turn from their sin. We understand this as Christian people, but I don't know that we necessarily feel like we have to live it out uh, to, the, to the T, for example. Uh, that we must turn from our sin and become truly devoted, faithful, and devoted. Truly faithful and devoted as in seeking God's help every day. How much do you think about God? Do you think, is, does He enter your mind every single day? Does He enter your mind s several times a day? Does He enter your mind all day long? Because I can tell you that the longer you're in a journey with Him, a faith journey with Him, the more He's going to be on your mind. The more he's going to be in your heart. The more you're going to be talking to him just as you're walking down the street or in your driving in your car. Whether it's considered, you've considered a prayer or just a conversation you're having with God. If you are truly faithful and devoted to God, you're going to find that that is happening in your life. You're going to be seeking him every day in some way or other. You're going to be keeping your, your mind on Christ daily. You're going to be keeping strong relationships with other Christians. So important. 
Living the Christian life is not living a life that's ordinary in any way. You know, I have no idea, I really don't, how so many people today, and Christians today, but I, and I'm thinking here in terms of the United States of America, how so many people have gotten the idea that we're just supposed to live this comfortable life you know, I don't bother anybody, they don't bother me, I'm happy. Let me have my time to do the things I like to do. Uh, that this is the kind of ordinary existence we're supposed to have. I don't know where that idea ever came from, because it certainly doesn't come from the scriptures. And if I were to sit here and tell you, you know, just go ahead about your daily life this week and uh, do your gardening or do your uh, exercise or uh, go out and do this or go out and do that, and it had nothing to do with Christ, uh, I certainly wouldn't be doing you any favors because that is the normal life. That's what most people are doing. They're going to work every day if they, if they have a employment. Um, they're going out and doing the things they enjoy after work or on the weekends or whatever. And, off, and, and God doesn't enter their mind most of that time, if at all. We're not talking about a life that's ordinary. I mean, how is it possible? How is it possible to live a life that is considered to be ordinary when there's an extraordinary God living inside you, if in fact he is. If God is living in you, who is anything but ordinary, if Christ, who, who's supposed to be number one in your life, Karen and I just had a round again uh, <laughs> this past week. Was that a Bible study? I forget where, no, she wasn't, forget where it was. But I think there were other people present. I said, honey, I want to be number two in your life. Not number one. And I don't want to be number one in her life. I want Jesus to be number one in her life. To me, that's the most important thing about our relationship. That I would be number two in her life, she would be number two in mine. That Jesus, and only Jesus would be number one. How could we live an ordinary life if Jesus lives in us and he gives us the example to live by? Did Jesus, if, if you were asked a question, did Jesus live an ordinary life, what would your answer be? Of course not. Then how could we live an ordinary life? How is it possible for a Christian to live an ordinary life? What other, other people would consider to be ordinary. You can't. The Holy Spirit is supposed to be guiding us and directing us. Every move we make, we're to let up to the Holy Spirit to just take control and lead. Have it your way. Have thine own way, Lord. Breathe on me, breath of God, as we sang earlier. How do you live an ordinary life when God is in your life who's anything but ordinary? If you've answered the sacred call, that was the subtitle of this, of this message today. If you've answered this sacred call, and I just simply say it's God's call on your life to be anything but ordinary. To live an extraordinary life. To thrive as God would have you thrive. You can't live an ordinary life with an extraordinary God in your heart. If you are, you're being disobedient. Now, if you go back far enough in history, you're going to find that, and I'm, now I'm going to be switching over to this idea of nations. And how we're living as a nation, and how Israel lived its life, and still is, as a nation. If you go back far enough in time, you'll see that it was the Israelites who were the first to be in a covenant relationship with God. They are the first ones as a nation to receive a sacred call. God called Israel to himself. He called them into a covenant and they answered the call. We know that. They agreed to the covenant. We will do whatever God says, the people said. That's what they said. That was one day. 
The next day it was different. They were definitely an on-again, off-again kind of people who seemed to be easily led astray from the sacred call that they had received and that they had accepted. And of course, they did that back in Moses' days with the Ten Commandments and, and the Covenant then. At that time in their history, and I have some scripture for you here, God said to the people, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. You yourselves. These were the, the covenant people of God. And how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Let's go on with some more. Now, this is what God says to the people. Now, if you obey me, what's the next word? I can't hear you. Fully. Now, if you obey me fully and you keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, look, all the nations in the world, how many nations even in that day were there in the world? A lot. Not like today because we have nations that grew out of other nations. Nations, out of all the nations in the whole world, you will be my treasured possession. Imagine that. Out of every, anybody that God could have chosen, he chooses Israel. And he says, if you will obey me fully and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine. God's saying it again. I could have chosen anybody. It didn't have to be you folks. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a, what kind of nation? Holy nation. Wow. What an opportunity for a people and an entire nation to be out of all the world's peoples to be God's most treasured possession. That's unbelievable. From time to time, like we've had in our own nation, Israel's leaders varied, should I say, from outstanding leaders and kings to despicable leaders and kings. You know, you only have to look at Israel's history to see how many times they turned their back on God. And for you Old Testament buffs, and I know Leroy Hibbs, I'm guessing Ronnie probably too, uh, some of you that have been teaching Sunday school for, for quite a number of years. Um, I, I'm guessing enjoy the Old Testament. Uh, of course, it's the foundation for the New Testament. But when you look back into that history and into the Old Testament days, and all the times that the people of God, chosen people, God's treasured possession, turned their backs on the Lord, turned their backs on Him who saved them, on Him who blessed them, on Him who protected them, on Him who provided for their every need. And He often did that with unbelievable, miraculous signs. I mean, nobody could deny these things that God did were of God because they were miracles. There was no explanation for these things. And what was one of the strongest contributing factors to both Israel's success and failure were these leaders and kings. But it was often more to their demise than it was to their good. Some of these leaders and kings, as we know from reading the scriptures, walked very closely with God. They lived in the covenant. They, they obeyed fully God's commands. And when they did, usually the people did too. Then they walked with God. And then there were some leaders and kings that didn't walk closely with God. And so too, often, did the people fail to walk closely with God. 
I mean, the, the kings, I, I, I get this image in my mind from time to time that the people followed the king so closely. If the king was an, an ungodly, evil man, that seemed like the, the people just followed suit. It was like the Pied Piper. Whatever tune he played, the people, the people sang. You know, but the only thing here is that when God's treasured possession, an entire nation of people acts like God doesn't even exist, which was the case for Israel off and on throughout its history. Disobeying God's ways, breaking his commands, living in sin, instead of being, as we just read, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. When those kinds of things happen, God eventually takes action. And when he takes action, it's going to affect everyone. If it's action against the nation, it's action against everyone. And God does take action. Now for the faithful, faithful people, faithful nations who have answered the call, who are walking with the Lord, who have desired to be in that relationship where they've been restored, reconciled to God through repentance. They've decided, they've determined that they want to be reoriented. You know, before in their sin they were disoriented. Now they want to be in a covenant relationship with God. So they want to, they want to be reoriented to that place that God would have them be so that they can truly thrive. For those kinds of people, there are rewards, and there are many of them. They're not just for Israelites. They're not just for the people of Israel. They're not just for the nation of Israel, but for all believers and all nations. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Leviticus chapter 26. And listen to all that God promises. I'm going to begin at verse 3. 26, Leviticus 26, verse 3. Now, I don't know if my words will match up perfectly with the words on the screen, but we'll be really close. If you follow my decrees, the Lord says, and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops. Farmers, listen to this. This is, this is an awesome text. I will send you rain in a season and the ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until planting. There's never going to be a time when things aren't going to be provided. Whether it's grapes or whatever. And you will eat all the food you want and you will live in safety in your land. So, so far, God has been talking about provision of food, they're meeting the people's needs, and them being in safety as well. I will grant peace in the land, and you will lie down, and no one will make you afraid. I will remove wild beasts from the land, and the sword, I'm going to come back to this later, and the sword will not pass through your country. You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers, and I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out to make room for the new. I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. These are the promises of God to those who are faithful. Jesus would add to that much later on. 
that his personal desire, the personal desire of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior and Redeemer, is that every believer would live with him forever. He prayed to his Father in John 17, that very prayer. That those that you have given me, Lord, would be with me forever. That they would see my glory. Now, I don't know how believers can know they have all of these promises given them to God by God himself and not be ecstatic. How could you know that God will do all these things for you and not be beside yourself? Not be full of joy? Not be thrilled? Which should lead then, if you are, which should lead to this. Give me another slide. A life where we strive to thrive. If you truly believe God's word and the promises that are there for those who are faithful to keep the covenant that God makes with every believer, then you should be living this. A life where we strive to thrive. It should be something you that's a, a, that comes as a second thought. It's, it should be right at the center of who we are and what we do. But then again, sin does get its way in people's lives. And when that happens, life takes on a completely different outlook. A different outlook about the way life should be lived. It produces a completely different outcome, too, when sin is in charge of our lives. And that's exactly what happened to the kingdom of northern Israel, which had departed. Well, let me say this first. For those of you who aren't up on your Old Testament, the kingdom of northern Israel was made up of ten tribes of Israel, ten of the twelve tribes of Israel. They departed from the other two tribes. The temple was in Jerusalem. And the other two tribes stayed there. Ten of the tribes left. They set up their own kingdom. And they set up their own capital, Samaria. And their own place of worship. But they didn't worship God. The king actually set up you know, one golden calf was enough to make God angry at Mount Sinai. You remember the golden calf? You remember what God did? The king of Samaria, the northern kingdom, he sets up a golden calf on the southern border and a golden calf on the northern border. And he tells his people, this, this, these are the gods that brought us out of Egypt. It wasn't one golden calf, it was two golden calves. I would think that would make God twice as angry. The king they chose to follow, his name was Jeroboam. And Jeroboam was a king who, remember I asked you to remember as we think about Israel, to think about America too. Jeroboam was a king who putting it mildly, mildly turned out badly. And so did the other kings that followed him in the northern kingdom. As the scriptures reveal, and it says this numerous times about each of these kings, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And finally, after years and years, we're talking now 300 years, go by with all sorts of kings who did evil in the eyes of the Lord. After all those years, God allows a breach to take place. A breach of the northern kingdom's defenses. You know, while they were walking with God, you remember when, when, they, when the, the people of Israel walked with God, and you re, we just read what the promises were, that if you walked with God and you're faithful, that they would be in peace. 
This wasn't the case any longer. We're talking 300 years. And over that 300 years, the people got worse and worse and worse. Kings burned their own burned their own as offerings to pagan gods. Finally, after 300 years, there's this breach. And 10 years later, that was in 732 BC and 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel is completely wiped off the face of the map. There is no more northern kingdom. The people disperse that are left after the destruction and they find their way wherever they can, intermixing, intermarrying with other tribes of the peoples, pagan worshipers, not followers of God, and that's what happened. Now for a minute I want to go back to Leviticus 26. And just as I shared with you what God promised he will do for those who are faithful to him, I want to share with you now what God promises to you to those who have sinned against him, uh, rebelled against him, defied him. This is going to be from 26, chapter 26, but we're going to pick it up in 14 where we left off, and we're going to read to 33. So I'm going to move through this, but I, you're, you're going to get a good taste of what God is saying will happen to those nations that go against his covenant, that don't keep the covenant. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. This is God's word to the Israelites. Then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror. Wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. You will plant seed. We just talked about what he will do for, those, for, for, the, for the grape harvest and so on and so forth and the way he would provide. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. If after all of this you will not listen to me, well, you think by then they would. But if after all of this you won't listen to me, I'll punish you for your sins seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of your land yield their fruit. If you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your afflictions seven times over as your sins deserve. I will send wild animals against you and they will rob you of your children. Destroy your cattle and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. In spite of these things, you do not, if in spite of these things you do not accept my correction but continue to be hostile toward me, I myself will be hostile toward you and will afflict you for your sins seven times over. And I will bring the sword on you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. When you withdraw into your cities, I will send a plague among you, and you will be given into enemy hands. When I cut off your supply of bread, ten women will be able to bake your bread in one oven, and they will dole out the bread by weight. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied." If in spite of this you still do not listen to me but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger I will be hostile toward you and I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places. Those are places of worship to pagan gods. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols and I will abhor you. I will turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries and I will take no delight in the pleasing aroma of your offerings. I myself will lay waste the land so that your enemies who live there will be appalled. I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. Let me follow up here in verse 36, God, if you will. As for those of you who are left, 
I will make their hearts so fearful in the lands of their enemies that the sound of a wind-blown leaf will put them to flight. They will run as though fleeing from the sword and they will fall even though no one is pursuing them. They will stumble over one another as though fleeing from the sword even though no one is pursuing them. So you will not be able to stand before your enemies. You will perish among the nations. The land of your enemies will devour you. Those of you who are left will waste away in the lands of their enemies because of their sins. Also because of their ancestors' sins, they will waste away. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility toward me, which made me hostile toward them so that I sent them into the land of their enemies, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. And so as we've witnessed here, God does promise in his word to punish people for their sins, just as he promises in his word to bless those who are faithful. And whether it's the individual or whether it's the nation, the same is true. And as we've just read, the punishment will be brutal, with one exception. When there's confession of sin, when the people turn their hearts back to God. You know, God always seems to, Old Testament and New, not just the New Testament, Old Testament and New, it always seems as though God really does want to forgive. No matter how far we've strayed away, God, that, it's, that, that hand is always out there. Reaching out for those who will reach back, who will turn back, who will, as I've said on other occasions, learn and turn. Those who want to be restored and rehabilitated. God's willing to forgive rather than dole out the punishment. And I am thankful for that, personally. I hope you are too. But unfortunately for the kingdom of northern Israel, who never learned and turned, who was never interested in restoration or rehabilitation, God began by allowing a breach to their defenses. God's promise to those who follow his decrees and obey his commands is that the sword, do you remember the verse we read? That the sword would not pass through their land. That was his promise to those who are faithful. The sword will not pass through your land, through your country. But that promise does not apply to those who don't follow his decrees and who don't obey his commands. And so it didn't apply to the kingdom of northern Israel. His own chosen people. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel. They're known today as the lost, ten lost tribes of Israel. Because they would not turn their hearts back to God. So instead of protection, they received punishment. And although it was a severe wake-up call, this first breach, God did not bring on then the total destruction. He still gave them ten more years. They still had time to answer the sacred call. They still had time to return to God and thrive as God would have them thrive. But would they? Of course. History tells us the answer is no. They wouldn't. And with all of that said today, because this is a series and it's going to go on, 
What does that say about the USA? What does that say about us as individuals? What does it say about our nation? How do we, how do we fit into this discussion? Was 9-11 a wake-up call? It was certainly a breach of the most sophisticated defense systems in the world. Was 9-11 a wake-up call for America and Americans? Is there a pattern? And we're going to look at that. And I'm going to let you decide for yourself what you what comes out of that. Is there a pattern being replayed in America today, in our day, in our time, like the one in ancient Israel? Will America and will Americans return their hearts to God? Will they answer the sacred call? We talked last week. We went around the sanctuary with all the things we listed that, were, that we believed as a congregation, not what Pastor Carvel said, what you folks contributed. We went around the whole congregation. Angie didn't think you were going to get done. The response was a lot greater, really, than I thought it would be. But I'm very thankful for the response you gave. But the question was, if you had to name a, a spiritual problem in the United States of America today, what is it? And we listed all kinds of spiritual problems, spiritual issues that people are having individually, but we're also having as a nation. Will America choose restoration and rehabilitation? Will we get back to the basics, living the godly life as God calls us to live? Or will we continue on this path we're on? A lot to think about. And as we go through each week, we'll share with you not just the fact that there was a breach in northern Israel and a breach in the United States of America on 9-11. We're going to share with you a lot of other very particular details. Unthinkable things that took place then and are happening now. The very words being uttered again 2,700 years later. Words of defiance against God. Sooner or later, as history has shown, God will act. And the question in all of this is, what can we do about these spiritual problems in America today? I mean, what is the church's role here? We can't just be bystanders. We can't just be onlookers. We have to listen to what God is saying for us to do and then do it as a church, as a people of God. Because if we don't do it, who is? If the people of God don't do something, who is? But no matter the numbers of armies, no matter the numbers of, of, of opponents, we read in the scriptures how those who are being blessed by God will pursue their enemies. Not be pursued, but pursue their enemies. If the church is faithful and is receiving God's favor, then what could stand against us? Is there anything? What could stand against the people of God if they're faithful to do the will of God in everything? We can begin with getting back to the basics. Linda chose a, 
a song that the choir was going to sing today, but we're all going to sing it together. And it's one that was popular maybe 20 years or 30 years ago called uh, Get Back, We Gotta Get Back to the Basics of Life. So I'm going to ask the choir to come up a while because we want to sing this song, but we want you to sing it with us. I think you'll recognize the tune. This was a popular tune uh, then, but it's not just the tune, certainly. It's the words. We've got to get back to the basics of life. What God would have us say. What God would have us do in our life. And ignore. Well, I shouldn't say ignore, should I? Because if we just ignore it like it's going to go away, we can't ignore what's happening around us. We certainly don't want to participate in what's going on around us that's evil. But we do need to take a stand. And it begins with you and with me, right here, what's in our heart, so that we can thrive. Let's sing it together.